Hi guys, welcome to the video series. As I mentioned in the LinkedIn post, I just wanted to create um, a series of videos to highlight uh, around the framework that I've built, how we can operationalize uh, MITRE ATT&CK in building effective security operation centers and explore some of the use cases uh, and some of the tools that um, MITRE have developed in related projects so we will discuss step by step how we can use the framework, how we can use the tools to build effective heat maps, how we can map the tactics, techniques and procedures, and how we can just use the framework for uh, better defense mechanisms, how we can use that for threat hunting, how we can um, evaluate the effectiveness of our security operation center, how we can evaluate the coverage of our tools uh, towards the tactics, techniques, and procedures against the framework, and some other use cases. So, how this framework came about? Uh, you know, the problem background was, you know, I guess the first question is, you know, first of all, to those who are not familiar, what is the Security Operation Center? So, Security Operation Center is essentially a heartbeat of any cybersecurity sort of department that's. Um, you know, it's, it's a heartbeat of all the operations where all the logs come in and that's where we solve all our incidents and we triage them. So Security Operations Center improves an organization threat detection. It, re it improves its response and prevention capabilities by unifying and coordinating all cyber t technology and operation. So you might ask, what is MITRE ATT&CK? So um, again, MITRE ATT&CK is a framework that if you think from military terms, uh, before organization used to use a cyber kill chain, but there is different adaptations to the framework. Uh, there was different um, terminology that has been used. So we needed a, a common framework. So MITRE created um, a collaboration between some of the largest organizations around the globe and created a framework that essentially, it's an extensible frame, framework from cyber kill chain that has 13 um, essentially uh, procedures, how we can track uh, the cyber threat actors and how they you know, achieve their uh, return on their investment. So um, it was developed around, you know, to create a common language sharing model, you know, how we detect tactics, techniques and procedures and you know it was it was created there to solve a problem. Um, we needed a unified way how we can share threat intelligence, how we can share information about threat actors, how we can create threat actor emulation uh, procedures in our defense mechanisms. So it was the framework was was born, um, and I think we are now in version thirteen. So there's been thirteen versions of the framework, and it expanded from you know using just for enterprise operations, it expanded into mobile, it expanded into operational technology uh, and various other use cases. And we'll discuss some of the frameworks that, you know, supplements it, some of the threat intelligence, how we develop, you know, analytics, how we develop um, threat emulation procedures, how we can automate some of the tasks. But essentially, the goal why we decided to use MITRE ATT&CK is essentially based on pyramid of, pyramid of pain, as you can see on the right hand side. So if we look at legacy operation centers or legacy, you know, cybersecurity operations, we used to work on, on the fact of, you know, all the malware and viruses, we used to detect them by signatures. So we used to detect things like, you know, hash values, IP addresses and domain names. The problem is, as the threat actors uh, and cybercrime gangs started to evolve, you know, if you, it, it's very easy to change a hash value of any worm or any malware. And you know, if you are familiar how hash values are generated, there's essentially it's variable length input and the same uh, same length output. So if you take any sort of malware and you create a hash for it, just by changing you know, one symbol, one comma in the malware, it creates completely different hash value. So it becomes very hard to detect these because they are essentially trivial, as it says in a, in a pyramid, it's trivial to change for threat actors. Same as IP addresses, same as domain names. So we needed to move up the pyramid towards the top 
that's where the tactics, techniques and procedures come. So we essentially we started focusing our operations around threat actor behavior. And that's why the framework was born, essentially to, to help us to move up the up the pyramid of pain and, and make detections better. You know, obviously it doesn't come with some of the legal, ethical and professional issues, you know. This framework built, if you build a framework for your organization that's aligned to specific threats, the information in the framework should be kept as highly confidential. So it should only be allowed to be viewed with people need to know, um, you know, roles. Also, when creating and evaluating um, threat emulation tactics, these should only be used internally and with explicit permission. Because threat emulation and weaponizing some of the you know tactics to to test the effectiveness of your SOC can only be done internally because otherwise we're obviously breaking the law if we're trying to test any other organization. So essentially, you know, my research question was how effective is the MITRE attack in building security operations centers despite the geopolitical situation? Because obviously, you know, geopolitical situation changes based on you know current affairs based on war and normally threat actors are the ones who um, have hacktivism sort of ideology um, ideologies they create specific you know campaigns but they're not predetermined on you know what we're trying to do in this framework and that's why we can discount the geopolitical situation because we take an organizations that are operating at specific geographic locations and we can cover some of them and I'll explain how we can expand them. We're also looking at the, in the, uh, the companies that operate in specific industries so we can create you know threat intelligence and we can see how we can map specific threat actors that would target our you know chosen organization and we can do a few different examples and I'll explain in the next video series how we can expand this and mold and do different examples in different sets of it. So, you know, I created a couple of aims and objectives of the framework and what I was trying to do and how I can, you know, showcase some of the things that I've done, some of the tools I used and hopefully, you know, inspire you guys to expand this framework as well as, you know, use and, and, and give some knowledge, you know, MITER attack is, adoption is increasing day by day, you know, there is a, there is a good reason for it because we might have developed a, a, a framework that allows us to, you know, um, create detections based on threat relevancy and on time so we can do you know as long as we have timely threat intelligence we can mold and adapt our defenses based on threats that are relevant for our organization we can also map so once we map the threat actors we can map them to into you know data components and data sources so we can ingest only specific you know data in our scene and this is very important because as we know most of the organizations moving their seam into cloud so data ingestion becomes a, a cost limiting factor so we also need to you know ingest data based on our relevancy and on our framework so we're not wasting money we also explore some of the uh, related projects such as car so cyber analytics repository how we can create analytics rule to detect those organization track threats how we can um, align our defensive posture as well. So there will be a dotted line, not only for detection in our so, but also some of the TDPs, if they are have significant matches based on threat actors, we, we don't want only to detect them. We want to improve our mitigations and our security program as well. And it's and the framework itself is built on a continuous maturity cycle. So we can always adapt and evaluate and bring the maturity as high as possible we're also you know creating a threat aligned security program and also we'll discuss how we can leverage deception technologies because deception technologies essentially brings us a couple of um bonuses in our defensive program we can create create uh, an increase in dwell time while threat actors you know struggle to find our crown jewels because we can replicate our crown jewels and, and create deception technology so we can actually gather for intelligence that they would be using in our unique flat flat um, environment and these will be made to our unique examples as well as you know 
one of the goals is meeting our client requirements. So obviously the framework is built on specific client where we can mold and adapt. And I'll show a few examples how we can address different other clients. So this is the framework. It's, it's essentially it's a six step process and it's a, it is, it's a circle. So it's continuous feedback loop. So the first step is we started with either we gather threat intelligence or once we already ran through one of the uh, couple of the cycles, we can enrich the threat intelligence together with deception technology output. So we merge the two two together. So whether we use you know, and it, and the the framework itself is kind of adaptive adaptable. So it's it doesn't matter the tools they use. It doesn't matter the of your organization structure because. Some people will use tools to gather threat intelligence. Uh, some organizations might have the whole threat intelligence team who can do directed and targeted research. Uh, or sometimes you can start even with Google. So if you pick, say, UK financial organization, you can go through target threat reports and you can see who are the, the cyber crime gangs, who are the APT groups that would target this um, you know, UK financial organization. And then we can start building the maps. So once we gathered the threat intelligence, collected the deception technology output, then we can map those threat actors um, into the relevant tactics, techniques, and procedures into the attack matrix. So we created essentially a heat map. And I'll show you in the next series how we can create the heat map because we'll create. Uh, for, for example, if we say we pick seven threat actor groups, so we can create seven layers from each threat actor group, and then I'll show you how we can combine those layers to create a one layer from all those seven layers, and it essentially becomes a heat map because the matching techniques between the threat actor groups will be a, essentially a higher priority. We can also map those tactics and procedures to the data sources as well as data components in those data sources. We'll also build analytics to detect those tactics, techniques, procedures based on those data components. And we also, there is a, uh, there's a key step in here. If we think about some of the, you know, tactics, techniques and procedures, essentially we are building detections in our SOC for it. But we don't always want to just detect them. If they are, if these, some of these techniques create a significant risk for organization and these are significant threat actors that leverage those techniques. We might want to include them in our security program so we can mitigate also uh, based on the risk and also risk quantification where we can evaluate how much it will potentially, you know, cost to create mitigations. Um, and then lastly, you know, we always will provide business context information for the threat intelligence gathering. So, you know, whether how our organization is shaping and changing, maybe we are expanding to different geographies that will add significant other threat actors that we need to track. Maybe we are um, pivoting into another industry as well. So there will be business context will be key information feeding into our threat intelligence cycle. So as I mentioned, you know, the one example that I'm, I'm currently, you know, exploiting is UK business that operates within financial services industry. So if we look at uh, threat intelligence reporting and some of the threat reports, these seven groups has been identified as predominant ones that attack the UK financial services organizations. So we have some ransomware groups such as Conti, PYSA, Logbit, so the Nokia B, uh, Fin7, also known as Cabinex, so that's International Cybercrime Group. We also got Lazarus Group, uh, that is sponsored by North Korean government, and also have TA505, which is a cybercrime group uh, using the their custom malware and info stealers. So we identified these seven threat actor groups. So if we map those seven threat actor groups and then create a, a unified heat map, it will look something like this. And I guess in the, probably in the next series, I can I'll highlight and showcase how we actually arrived at this heat map, how we build, and then what we can do with this heat map. Because we can export this heat map into JSON format using for you know automation and feeding into our socks. We can also export it into CSV. And that's what I like sometimes as well, because we can export it in CSV file format 
and we can arrange by priority. So as you can see, for example, in the legend, so we mapped seven threat actor groups. So obviously I attributed a score to each threat actor group. So when we combine that, it creates a heat map. So obviously, as you can see, the red uh, technique has six matches between the seven threat actor groups. So obviously this is the one that's been used the most out of all of these threat actor groups and we and as you can see the matches goes from mostly red to from six matches five four three and all the way to down to one so obviously when we export into csv we can create a, a prioritized list of those techniques of those techniques and then uh, map that So, as I mentioned, you know, we can export it into CSV and create a prioritized list. So, this prioritized list allows us to project track based on priority. So, we can obviously uh, firstly attack the most match tactic techniques and procedures and create a, a project list how we're going to ingest all of this data in our SOC or our security incident and event management platform which is a you know a significant way because we 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 created the targeted plan based on matches and based on obviously priority and i'll showcase some of these things uh in, in separate video series where i you know i explain this the, the the step by step more closely and showcase the tools that i've used within so you know once we build the framework you know um in that client specification, we can, as I mentioned, we can extract those TDPs into CSV format. We can list them by number of matches and map that, you know, TDPs to the data sources and data components. Another key point is we create analytics rules to detect, to detect those TDPs and I'll showcase, you know, how we can build specific analytics rules to make sure that they detect and then obviously how we can check the efficiency of those analytics rules. We can also apply automation in the incident triage and how we can, you know, build responses based on specific analytic rules. And also the, the sort of the last part in our maturity cycle of the framework development and our SOC operations essentially is to deploy deception technologies. So, you know, as mentioned in the beginning, deception technologies not only kind of creates a, a dwell time for our threat actors and, and, and throws them off the scent of our crown jewels, but we also gather critical threat intelligence so we can see what steps and what techniques and what tactics that the actors would use and that is predicated to our specific environment so we can essentially track and evolve our defenses based on we, what we discover in our deception technologies we can also use the vulnerabilities they're trying to exploit we can use the you know sometimes we can even detect some of the you know um dictionaries that they would use for you know username and password spray attacks and things like that so we can gather a lot of informations that we can take it forward in our defense development and then lastly you know i mentioned there's a few projects that we can potentially expand our future research and projects so you know the framework as itself has been is built for you know my attack for the enterprise framework but we can also map this for industrial control systems. There is mappings for mobile uh, applications. There's also mapping for cloud. So if if you know sometimes if an organization is moving towards you know cloud native, cloud mapping might be really important. Also, you know every year Mitre is updating the framework itself. So currently we are on version 13. We can adopt a new MITRE release iterations because every release iteration usually adds a few tactics or techniques and how they form the, the new research into new specific techniques that's out there used by threat actors. You know, it's also predetermined on the continuous threat landscape evaluation. You know, and, and as mentioned, you know, there's uh, three key uh, projects that are uh, related to the MITRE attack. So it's Cascade, so how we can automate blue team investigation the car which is the cyber analytics repository and the caldera which is automated adversary emulations how, how we can do adversary emulation to 
you know, check the efficiency of those analytics and, and, and tactics that we are tracking in our security operations to see whether we're detecting those adversaries in our, um, essentially in our environment. And then lastly, you know, I've been given a few uh, questions to answer. So, you know, where do we see MITRE attacks? You know, where's the forecast and where, where the threat actors are sort of expanding their usage and their and their sort of operations i think you know as we've seen around threat landscape you know everyone is trying to leverage into uh, um you know ai in their operations so um you know artificial intelligence is there is there to stay i think so the key point is instead of you know us being worried about artificial intelligence we need to be able to leverage that in our security operation center as well so now how we can leverage artificial intelligence to create a better mappings, how we can refine the artificial intelligence and use case that for threat intelligence, maybe uh, for automation as well. You know, um, secondly, you know, deep learning could help us tremendously. You know, I kind of touched a few things about, you know, how we leverage threat intelligence. But whether it's tools, whether it's teams, how we can automate and create the faster feedback loop, that will be the key, how we can, you know, mold our defenses to specific threats. So if I'm sure, you know, if we can find the tools that are API driven based on threat, threat intelligence landscape, we can pass that threat intelligence and making sure that it aligns to our unique uh, organization footprint. And we can create those mappings directly from the tools into my you know, navigator and automate some of these parts and how we can then back ingest into our, you know, specific socks and make sure that it aligns in terms of coverage, in terms of effectiveness. So um, these are the kind of the key, um, key few turns that we will take as we explore this um, series further, you know. I'm always happy to hear, you know, any feedback, any comments, any other potential avenues that I should exploit during these video series. Uh, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Marius Poskus. Um, please do reach out, you know, I'll try and share as much of the knowledge that I've gathered while building this dissertation and framework, and hopefully, you know, expand your guys' knowledge around MITRE ATT&CK and how we can be leveraged and used going forward. Thank you.